Our goal is to actually provide a pathway towards community by using coding as a method to, as a method for job opportunities, as a method for job opportunities and um, second chances. Can I play this video? Early on about when JC had his original idea, it's about haircuts, right? That's what you know, that's what you feel, that's what you should stick with. And we'll wrap technology around that. Them just seeing me be successful, knowing I came from the same place they came from, to me gives them a vista into my life and what theirs could be. Not unlike what made me successful. The 10 new TLM graduates. My name is Chris Field, Kenyatta Leal, and I'm the founder and CEO of Coach Potato. What we do is get football fans off the sidelines and into the game. My aspiration for the future, um, wow, I want to be a, a good husband, good father, good stand-up guy in my community. Months ago, I was incarcerated here at San Quentin with a sentence of 25 to life. Not 16, 2, or 3, but 25 of them with a kickstand, as y'all know what I'm talking about. And it's no joke. By the grace of God, after 19 years, my sentence was overturned, and I was released in 2013. Throughout my incarceration, I was blessed to meet many people who helped me in one way or another. But it wasn't until I came to San Quentin and immersed myself in the programs here that I really began to make significant changes in my life. I realize there are a lot of those out there who don't believe that prison programs can help change people's lives. But I stand before you today as living proof that they do. All of us have been knocked off course once, maybe even twice in our lives. Landing at a destination and in a situation, struggling to make sense of how we allowed ourselves to drift so far off course, so far away from our intended purpose. Peter asked me for you to say your first five words. Thank you, God. It's so good to be free. That's more than five. That's what I'm feeling right now. Thank you. Great, so we watched that video that was mostly concentrating on our entrepreneurship program. We started off in San Quentin about seven years ago. There we were just uh, business training, we did resume building, job training, um, and we, it all culminated in a demo day where we, our students would actually present a business idea to Silicon Valley investors inside San Quentin State Prison. This is about 400 audience members, a lot of the students have never done public speaking before, and it was this really great aspirational event. But what we really wanted to do now is to pivot towards hard skills. And that's where we moved to coding, functional programming. And right now, we are in five prisons, including two women's facilities, which is really exciting. Uh, we teach HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Our program is broken up into two parts. One is a beginner track. It's six months four days a week, 10 hours a day in front of the computer, constantly dedicated to code, learning how to code all without internet access. So imagine this, you know, all of you are use the computer, all of you guys have learned how to code. Imagine doing this in an area where you haven't had a lot of computer, you know, computer access, if any, and now you're learning how to code without any internet access. So it's an incredibly difficult task. Um, but our students are dedicated, they're motivated, they're driven, and they see this as a, as a lifeline, as an opportunity for a better future. And so today I have one of our students who have graduated our program. Uh, he finished our first track and our second track and is our first returned citizen who has completed our computer coding program. Please, in, please welcome Ali Tambora. Good afternoon. Um, I have to tell you guys, uh, I haven't seen people move to lunch like that since I left San Quentin. <laughs> it was uh, it's quite impressive. You know, they, they, you guys have a bell and they'd yell chow and we'd do the same thing. We'd move to San Quentin, uh, move to the, uh, the lunch line. Um, 
So my name's Ali Tambora. Um, I've been out of San Quentin, I think tomorrow will be my third month. I spent 12 years, four months and 21 days incarcerated. Um, and what I want to talk to you guys is kind of my journey through the um, Department of Corrections um, and what the last mile has done for me um, and, and how that that fo my focus um, in prison changed when I got introduced to the last mile. Um, I was convicted in 2004 of threatening to shoot my now ex-wife. Um, you know, it's something I'm not proud of, but it's something I, I accept responsibility for. Um, you know, I, I uh, was in a bad situation and, and made some really bad choices in that situation. And um, there's a lot of men like me in San Quentin who um, not necessarily lived this life of crime, but found themselves in, in, a, in a bad situation and kind of chose the wrong path um, in that situation. Um, that being said, uh, I, was, I was sentenced to 14 years, eight months in prison. Um, and the way it works is each, each prisoner, when you first go into the prison system, you're scored. Um, there's a bunch of, of, of different um, parameters they use to figure out where, what kind of prison they're going to send you to. Um, unfortunately, because of the amount of time I was sentenced to, I was sent to a, a murder max prison. And I remember you know, sitting in my cell and thinking, you know, how am I going to do this? How am I going to get through um, 14 years, eight months of prison. You know, I'd never done a day in the county jail or anything like that, so I had no idea what to expect. Um, and when I got to Corcoran, it was worse than what I expected. Um, the first day I was there, the correctional officers shot and killed a man on the yard. And um, from that day forward, it was just acts of violence on top of acts of violence on top of acts of violence. Um, I was petrified. Um, uh, I look like a serious guy, but you know, inside I'm I'm not this serious. Um, and so, being in that kind of environment um, changed my purpose. Right when, before before I uh, went to prison, I had a purpose much like every other American or every other citizen of this of this planet, and it's kind of like love and be loved and take care of your family and, um, you know, raise kids and, and do those things. Well, when I got to Corcoran, my purpose switched to survival. Every day, I became hypervigilant and tried to figure out how am I going to survive? How am I going to make it to the next day? Um, how do I stay away from the areas where the gangs are? How do I, um, you know, stay out of the... the um, shot line of the guard towers. Um, on those prisons, they have this thing that's called uh, no warning shots. And everywhere inside the, inside the prisons, there's these placards on the walls that say no warning shots. And what that means is um, if a gentleman is stabbing another person next to you and the guard starts firing, if you get shot on accident, it's too bad, right? You're just, just collateral damage. And it happens. Um, it doesn't, fortunately, it doesn't happen often, but um, I remember um, being in the shower one day and um, some inmates were attacking one of the staff, and so the guy in the gun tower was firing as one of the guys was running down the tier to help his comrades attack staff, and one of the bullets came in the shower I was in and shattered the tile next to me. And um, it was pretty horrific. It, it, was, it was really a tough time. And about two years into my, my uh, stay at Corcoran, I heard about this college program they had at San Quentin. And I wrote my counselor, and my counselor uh, was a pretty progressive guy. And he, he looked at me and he said, hey, I don't think you really are Corcoran material, so I'm going to help you get transferred to San Quentin. And that was kind of the beginning of my transformation. Um, San Quentin is really unique to the California prison system. I think they have about 3,000 volunteers 
And the last I checked, I think there's 3,800 um, inmates in San Quentin. Obviously, all of those volunteers don't come in at the same time. But um, because of the amount of people coming into the prison, there's a lot of rehabilitation going on there. There's a lot of transformative programs, um, such as The Last Mile. So when I got to San Quentin, I, um, I worked in a print shop, and um, we printed forms for the Department of Corrections. And uh, I was told there was a newspaper. There had been a newspaper at uh, San Quentin back to the 1940s. And I was asked to get involved in the newspaper. I got involved in the newspaper, which is still going. It's, uh, it's, uh, you can look at it online, sanquentinnews.com. And then I saw this program come in called The Last Mile. And um, they were advertising an entrepreneurship program. Um, there were some parameters. You, you couldn't be in trouble. You had to be disciplinary free. Um, and so I filled out an application and got accepted into the program. And basically what we did was um, we came up with a business idea with a technical component and a social component and um, built a comprehensive business plan around that idea. And then we pitched on a demo day. So um, got to read some, some really cool people, a lot of, a lot of people from Sand Hill Road, um, um, big venture capitalist. It was, it was enlightening to see that People, like, people from the business community were interested in what was going on in prison. And um, I went through that and it really felt great. I mean, it was, it was a, a great opportunity and a wonderful experience. And at that point, I kind of figured out that my purpose had changed. You know, all of this time of trying to survive prison um, had changed into I felt kind of like a human being again. And same with all of the guys that are, were in the program with me. You know, um, we, we all gathered around. We're reading business books. And, and that high kind of ended. And the last mile came up with this coding curriculum. And once again, I applied and I got in. And um, I'm pretty decent at math. And I thought, for the, the guys in here that code, so I thought, oh, yeah, coding, yeah, no problem. Yeah, I'll, I'll get in, 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 you know, it'll be easy. And yeah, um, coding kind of um, body slammed me. It, it, it was um, some tough concepts. We don't have uh, internet connectivity in there. Um, I love it out here, and now I'm coding. I can, you know, go to Stack Overflow and say, hey, I've got this problem, and, um, you know, 30 people have answers on there. Um, but we started off, actually, with no computers at all. So learning JavaScript and, um, you know, the HTML and CSS was kind of the ABCs, but getting in and, and kind of diving into the more deeper subjects of computer science and JavaScript was very difficult. Um, but we, we dove in, and we, the program really changed the culture in San Quentin. Before I left, there were these all kinds of inmates anticipating that they were going to get into the program, carrying the... John Duckett books or O'Reilly books, um, really wanting to be in the program and wanting to code. While I was in the program, the first track I went through um, was, was fairly difficult. Um, the second track I went through was even harder, uh, which was more, more in-depth computer science. And then the third track, we learned, learned some back-end stuff. We learned some um, Node.js and some other uh, frameworks. And for our graduation, we built um, full stack applications. And so um, I built uh, a, uh, an application that showed um, the impact of childhood diseases across the United States um, back from the 1910s um, to current. And I used a JavaScript library called D3 to build it. And it was really, really rewarding. Um, from there, um, we were kind of in limbo, the guys that graduated. And for these, those of you who, who write code, you understand that you, you have to continue to write code and you have to continue to learn. And so the last mile partnered with the Department of Corrections and they created the first of its type joint venture, which is a, a collaboration between the department and private industry 
where we have a group of inmates inside who are, are building apps and websites for private industry. So I invite anyone in here, if you guys need a website built, have it built inside San Quentin. And the whole idea is to give inmates the ability to make money, and I'll kind of go into that. Um, the, the average pay for an inmate in the Department of Corrections is about 13 cents an hour. Um, so I worked, usually my paycheck was about 32 bucks a month. And out of that, they take 55% to pay restitution, so fines. And most people don't pay their fines off while they're inside. Um, you end up paying them off when you're inside, outside. And so what usually happens is guys leave prison and the California Department of Corrections gives them $200. And so um, I don't know about you guys, but um, $200 doesn't go far in this world. Um, I don't think you can stay in a hotel room for, you know, more than a night or two for 200 bucks. And so a lot of guys, especially guys who are in for drug offenses, when you're pushed out the door of a California state prison with $200 in your pocket and you have the stigma of, of being, stigmatism of being in prison, it's really hard to get on your feet. Um, and for the drug dealers, it's easier to take that $200 and go down to the local drug dealer and buy some drugs and stand out on a corner and start selling drugs and take your chances with um, ending up back in prison. And that's exactly what happens. Um, during my incarceration, I saw countless men just coming in and out, in and out, in and out. And um, it, it, it was sad. You know, guys would, and decent guys, um, would have these plans that I'm going to get out and I'm going to do the right thing, and they get out and there's no opportunity for them. Absolutely nothing. And um, even guys that have some skills um, trying to get in and marking on that application that I have a felony conviction kind of precludes you right away from actually getting a job. And so the reason the last mile worked for me is, one, is I got to work for the joint venture. And the guys, instead of making 13 cents an hour, they're making 16.77 an hour. And what happens is that money goes into a savings account. And so when they get out, they get access to the savings account, along with the $200 that the state gives you. Um, but when, when I left um, San Quentin, you know, I had thousands of dollars in my bank account. And not only did I have thousands of dollars in my bank account, I had a marketable skill. I could get out and say, hey, I can write JavaScript. I had a portfolio of projects that I've built that people could go look up on the web. And so um, there's, I believe there's 14 of us, uh, Natrina. Four, 14? 14 of us that have come through the program and um, have been reintroduced into society, and we have a 0% recidivism rate. And every last one of our graduates are working. Um, it, it's... <laughs> Thank you. I have to tell you this story. So I, I'm walking down the street. I, I live in San Jose. I ride Caltrain into the city every day um, to my job, which is not far from here on Market Street. And I'm walking to work, I'm a few minutes late, and I hear a couple of guys calling my name. And I'm, I'm thinking, well, who the, who the heck knows my name in, in San Francisco? And I look, and it's two guys that I was in San Quentin with. And they're like, hey, man, what are you doing? And long story short, we went and ate breakfast and sat there and talked about our careers in tech. And I just, I mean, how profound is that? to meet guys um, working in tech who were in prison with me um, literally months ago. And all of these guys are employed. And so I think technology has, I don't think, I know technology has the ability to end this 70% or almost 70% recidivism rate that's going on in our prison system. 
um, I was I was reading that there's going to be about two million empty jobs for people who write code in the next ten years. Um, California has a hundred and thirteen thousand men who are and women who are incarcerated, and many of them are leaving without marketable skills. Um, the last mile is ending that. And so I'm here today to kind of evangelize my colleagues that are coming out behind me and letting you guys know that there's qualified coders coming out of prison who are dedicated to making a change in their lives and dedicated not to go back to prison. Um, also, like I said before, for those of you who, who um, are in need of some coding work, um, get in touch with Natrina, and we can have our guys in there, you know, build functions, build apps, build things for your projects that you're working on now, things that, uh, that you might not necessarily have the time to do or things that you might offshore. And with all of this being said, one of the things that I really want to do is I want to talk to you guys. Um, I'm very, very transparent. There is nothing that you cannot ask me um, about my prison experience, about my offense, about the last mile, anything. Um, I don't want anyone in this room to be shy. A lot of people get their, their perspective on what prison is from the nightly news or from you know, one of these shows, Lock Up, or something like that. And that's really not what prison is. I mean, there are some very bad people in prison, um, but there's a lot of people in prison who are just looking for a second chance and want a second chance. So with that, I, I want to open it up to questions. Sure. So there's two components of the last mile. The last mile is a nonprofit, so um, they they function a lot on grant money. They've gotten grants from the state and donations, but the 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 there's the coding program that's actually building applications inside prison is an arm called the Last Mile Works or TLM Works, and TLM Works works for profit, and they take that money and put it back into the program. So the guys get paid out of the funds for the companies that hire them to build um, applications. Any other questions? Come on, you guys have, you can ask me anything. Go ahead. So how did you get your answers to questions that you now that look easily through Stack Overflow? You know, I, I feel it's cheating sometimes to go to Stack Overflow. <laughs> um, because, you know, I, I've got... I've literally, I've got a stack of books that I, I you know, guys were like, are you going to leave your books in here? I'm like, hell no, I've spent like 700 bucks on books, <laughs> you know. Um, but when we had problems, um, we had to dig into, I, I like the O'Reilly books, we had to dig into books and collaborate, you know. We'd sit there and look and go, God, you know, this doesn't have anything in there with the problem that we have. And we'd try different things and um, a lot of times, you know, go back to my bunk and sleep on it. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you guys. I've had dreams about writing computer code. Um, but um, I think one of, the, one of the things that's made me stronger in writing um, JavaScript is that I've had to figure those things out. I had to delve deeper into kind of what was going on in the code rather than going and just getting you know, an answer or copying somebody else's code. I see how that works really well if you're working on the clock for a client and, you know, time is money. Um, but as far as understanding and having a deeper understanding of computer science, I think it was much more beneficial uh, than going to Stack Overflow than actually diving, you know, deep into the code and finding answers for myself. And the collaboration part. I really... I didn't understand um, the idea of paired programming um, when, when I was in prison. Um, prison is a, a very segregated place, and you learn to, to really shield yourself from other people. 
And so the idea of collaborating with things was something was is it was something that at first I was really like, wait a minute, because you you don't really let people in because you don't know what their motives are. And so that was another aspect of the last mile and having to collaborate with people that I live with in prison to build applications and to write code and to learn um, was also a thing that's kind of transformed over here. I collaborate with one of the, the head engineers where I work now, and, and it's, you know, it's, a, it's a great experience. I've, I've learned a lot from him. Yes? Uh, I looked back and forth during the last question. You didn't understand pairing, you said initially, but uh, was pairing part of the program or something you found out about afterwards? Pairing was part of the program, and I have to tell you, we all, all of the, the guys in the, I was in the first track, we all fought against it. Right? We were like, no way. I'm not, you know, you put me with this guy, really? And, um, but you quickly learn that this guy next to you might see things in a total different paradigm than what you're seeing it at. And, and um, paired, paired programming is, um, it's where it's at now. You know, it's, it's, uh, it was really enlightening. But it also made me work closely with the guys around me, and, and it broke down a lot of the barriers that I've, I'd built up for many, many years of being incarcerated. It's really hard to trust people inside prison. And so when you're building an application that's your baby, and you get this guy that's you know, building some functionality, you have to learn to trust that guy because you really can't do it all. Yes. Um, so aside from supporting the last mile, what can those of us in this room come to help you to your, your professional success? Mm -hmm. What else is graduate coming out of last mile? I'm on a very, very good track. Um, the last mile in the business community has done very well in supporting me. Um, my goal is to get people um, like you in this room to support my colleagues who are coming out. Um, I have, because I'm the first guy that's come out of the coding program, I've set up my cell phone so the guys inside can call me. So I get calls, I mean, all the time. Well, what's it like? Or how are you writing code? And, you know, what's going on? And are they really getting us jobs when we come out? And, you know, I'm telling them, yes, 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 yes. And so um, there's lots of things people can do to support the last mile. We have volunteers that go in, um, uh, I think it's twice a month um, on Wednesdays, um, engineers that go in and sit down with the students and help them through problems, um, partnerships, giving interns, internships to uh, men coming out of prison, and then also financially supporting the last mile. Yes. You said that only 14 people have come out so far. Yes. How, are you gonna, how does last mile make that much bigger? So we started in San Quentin, um, and we're scaling into other prisons in California. We'll be in six prisons um, at the end of this or the end of this year, beginning of this year. Um, so we're scaling into the different prisons. We're in the women's prison in Folsom now, and so it's scaling. Um, they're also setting up a program where. Um, people in the other prisons will be able to transfer to San Quentin because we've got a significant server stack and a lot of our curriculum, the second part of the uh, curriculum is built into San Quentin. So people will start the first tracks in other prisons, get transferred to San Quentin, and then be able to parole from San Quentin, which is located you know, right here in the hub of tech. Yes? The curriculum is ever evolving. Um, when we began, we had a partnership with um, Hack Reactor here in San Francisco. Um, they built uh, the curriculum that I went through. Um, since then, we've used portions of their curriculum, portions of online content, and built our own um, learning management system around that content. Um, and we also have things that are kind of project specific. 
So, for instance, like when I learned Node.js, um, we had people who were interested. Um, I think I can say, can I? Air, Airbnb wanted us to build a uh, a dashboard for them, uh, built around their social media stuff. So we brought in a curriculum, just teaching Node.js for the guys that went on to work on that project. So um, we're not just limited to um, JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. There's all kinds of other libraries that we're bringing in. And so it's a continued education thing where um, I'm hoping, I've been really pressing to get them to start doing mobile apps inside also. And so I hope we, we progress into that area. Yes. Go ahead. What's the average size of the company that hires last 12 graduates? Oh, that varies. So um, from small to large, I mean, uh, most of the companies have been kind of mid-sized companies. I, I think I'm working for the smallest company. But well, one of the things that's that's um, been really enlightening are the founders, um, Chris Redlitz and uh, Beverly Parenti, are really active in the business community. And so they're in touch with a lot of the hierarchy of these tech companies. And so, um, you know, if a CEO says, hey, give this guy an internship, it happens. And so it, we're not, historically, we're not going through the normal HR channels. Uh, um, you know, it kind of gets bypassed. And I, I got to tell you, every company I go to where, where um, I went to a social event last week at a company here in San Francisco, and everyone was in there was like, oh, you're one of those last mile guys? And I got a job offer, you know, at a social <laughs> event. And I'll, you know, so, so um, I think once you get the guys in and are actually working in a workspace and, and you know, we know. We know eyes are on us. We know that we've got to perform and um, everybody's doing well. You had a question. Making, I, if there was one factor that would have prevented you from like, making it out and integrating again with society and being able to successfully stay out of prison. Prison is a, a, it's like a minefield. And there's just so, so, so many obstacles in prison. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, there's two ways to look at it. I was 38 years old when um, I committed my offense. And so I was set in my ways. Prison gangs couldn't recruit me, um, and they tried. And you know, it's much harder for younger men. And so um, a young man that gets involved in a prison gang and gets involved with that kind of violence usually ends up getting more time. That type of activity would preclude you from you, or it would prohibit you from getting involved in the last mile because you have a long history of, of write-ups and and. Um, and it's problematic. But that being said, I have to tell you a story. There's a young man um, who came into our dorm. He was 19 years old. And um, I watched his whole activity with the gangs. And um, I was taking a shower, I'll be specific. And um, he got out of the shower before me. And I went to get in the shower, and one of the gang members told him, they said, hey, uh, you've got to ask the homies if they want to shower, that way I wouldn't get the shower next. They would, they would keep passing it to their guys, so I would have to wait. And he was like, uh, I don't want to be using expletive, but he's like, you know, F you. You guys are grown men. Take your own. If you want to take a shower, get in line. I thought, hey, man, that guy's pretty bold. So I, I pulled him aside, and I said, hey, you want to write computer code? And he goes... <laughs> He goes, well, well, what is that? I said, like web pages. And he goes, well, I guess. And he's, he's one of the star students. I hear about him all, all the time. His name is Marcelino. And getting him, into the, getting him into the program kept him from being heavily recruited by the gang. And, you know, I was, 
I, and his work too, right? He's, he's put in a lot of work, but um, just, a, just a little bit, just that, that's kind of the idea of opportunity, right? He was given a little bit of opportunity. He jumped on it. He's off the prison yard eight hours a day. He's off work, writing computer code. And when he's back at his bunk, he, it, you know, it's required that you study. It's not easy. So, you know, you go back and you have three, four hours of study at your bunk and you're working all day, it makes it really hard to get in trouble. Yes. Oh, let me ask someone who hasn't asked a question. Go ahead. Uh, back to the curriculum question, um, do you teach source, or with source control also taught? And what about process things like Agile or things of that sort? Do you learn that? So, so we learned, um, and that's, that goes to volunteers. So we've had people come in and kind of teach the, the whole philosophy of Agile um, development. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of other processes that go along with writing code are built into the, the curriculum. So each, each, each one of our, when you're, when you're writing code, each one of our functions kind of build on the, the previous function. And so you get, you get into that, that mode of writing software like a professional out here. And we're really about test-driven development also. So, um, you know, that's... That's what I'm doing right now is building curriculum for the guys inside and, you know, writing tests to make sure that the stuff that they write actually works. Yes. One of the things that I struggled with and other people struggle with as software engineers is imposter syndrome in the sense that engineering is something that these other people do that I can't because I just can't do it. Is there any part of this last month program that's the social aspect of like helping people think about that and deal with it? So we have a business professional that comes in and kind of, he, he teaches um, confidence building and things like that. And, and I, I read about imposter syndrome. I'm 50 years old and learned to code two years ago. So I know the feeling, right? I know the feeling when I have a volunteer who's 22 years old come in and solve a problem that I've been working on for a week and, and a minute and a half. Um, so I've felt that. I mean, I think all software developers feel that as, as far as from what I've read. Um, but just push on, push on through. Yes. What's the dropout rate for people who start the program? So I, I think right now, Natrina, correct me if I'm wrong, it, it's about 10%. 10% dropout rate. You have guys that go in and just say, hey, I don't want to do this. This is just too hard. Um, and then you, uh, we've had guys that get transferred. You know, because of mass incarceration, um, the department shuffles people around a lot um, to try to make room. And so every once in a while, you'll lose a few guys. That's getting better where the program's gained enough traction where they can say, hey, don't transfer my guys. Um, and every once in a while, we have someone who gets in a fight or a disciplinary problem, and, and we lose them, too. Um, go ahead. Uh, what kind of support are you getting from lawmakers and prison officials to support these sort of programs specifically? So for that, I'm, I'm going to kind of go back to, I worked at the San Quentin News before I got involved with The Last Mile. And um, in that capacity, we invited district attorneys and lawmakers into the prison. Um, I mean, they just had another uh, symposium I, last week. And the pendulum has kind of swung. You know, around 2006, it was way over to the right. And, and it was just that lock them up and throw, throw away the key thing. Um, you know, the, the amount of money we spend on prisons in this country is atrocious. You know, I think we spent close to $60 billion last year. California prison budget is $10 billion for 121,000 men. Um, you know, some European countries don't have budgets like that um, for 14, 15 million people. And so people are learning and understanding that the current model is not working. And that includes the Department of Corrections itself. The Department of Corrections has really changed its model. You know, without them, programs like The Last Mile wouldn't exist. You know, they control who they let into their prisons. And um, the, the current director of the CDCR, Scott Kernan, 
um, is on board and they're doing everything they can to get that recidivism rate lower. And it's programs like The Last Mile, getting people straight out of prison into a job is very, very, very important. You know, you don't want a guy sitting around or lounging around and the model's working. Everybody that, that comes out goes to work. They're not going back to prison. And showing lawmakers this, um, they get right on board. So some of the, some of the district attorneys, especially uh, um, Jeff Rosen in San Jose um, and the San Francisco district attorney here, um, evangelize programs that are reducing the recidivism rate. Right? Yes? What's your take on doing the same kind of a model in non-tech space, so all the other kind of skilled trades, or does that already exist? Kind of skilled trades, okay, things that are so, non-tech. So the, the, the department, they have things in their uh, auto mechanics. I worked in a print shop um, years and years ago. Um, the thing is, is there's, there's not a big demand like there is for people with these technical skills. And a lot of those, a lot of those trades don't pay a living wage, right? Sh sure, you can get out and go into um, janitorial or, or landscape maintenance and some of the trades like that, but it's really, really, really hard to support a family and, and have a living wage on those type of skills where um, computer coding is a, a whole new ball game. Yes. How many of the inmates, like what percentage know about the Last Mile program and uh, you know, are kind of aware of it and know who's in it and who? How fast, how, how fast do rumors spread in this company? <laughs> so it's, it's, there's, a, there's this really crazy dynamic where um, the prison guards would come to inmates and ask inmates what's going on. Right? The prison would be locked down or something. The guys would come on and say, what's going on? Word spread so fast in the California prison system. It's unbelievable. We'd hear about things that happened at other prisons before the staff at San Quentin would know what happened at other prisons. Um, so it spreads quickly. Um, we get inquiries from parents of incarcerated individuals weekly wanting to get their their loved one from a certain prison transferred to San Quentin. So the word is out. I mean, it's, it's um, just, I'd, I'd, I'd garner that almost every inmate in the California prison system knows about the last mile. Do they know who's in it and who's not in it? Well, if they're not at San Quentin, they don't know who's in it and who's not in it. But one of the things that, that um, is kind of cool is the prison newspaper goes to every institution in, in the state and some ins institutions out of state, and um, they evangelize the last mile too, so people at other prisons get to read the San Quentin news and see what's going on in San Quentin, and that helps spread the word also. Yes? So each, each cohort um, in San Quentin, I don't know the answer to the 92? 92. Yes. What was the transition like for you from prison to working in the tech industry? It's, it's almost seamless, and it, it's, I'm having trouble with that, right? <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, my friends are like, I, I hung out with my friends for New Year's, and they're like, hey, man, it's like, you, you didn't even leave. Like, you go to work every day, and you're, you're, you're back. And I, I, was, I was talking to someone this morning. I was talking, um, I, dr I drive to the train station every day, and I reach for the shift mechanism in the old car that I drove 13 years ago. It's different than the car I have now. And it, I've been out three months, and it seems like I've been out for a year already. Um, it's it's kind of scary how easy it went. And I'm still on supervision. And so when I go down to the office and see other people who are on supervision, who have been released from prison, who are struggling, you know, it's, it's hard to see. And I, I look at those people, and I go, that could be me. That could be me without a paycheck. 
That could be me without a job. That could be me without clothes. Um, kind of an interesting story is I, I, I went to parole, and um, the guy next to me, he had a card, a gift card for Safeway, and he had a gift card um, for Target for clothing, and he had a, a card to get his driver's license. Uh, it was a voucher where the state pays for you to get your driver's license. And I went in, and I asked the uh, parole officer, I said, hey, can I get a voucher to get my driver's license? And he looked at me. He goes, you have a $1,000 phone. You're wearing, like, at least $200 worth of clothes. I'm dealing with people who are homeless. If you really want this, you can sit out in the, in the uh, reception area, and I'll do the paperwork, but it's going to take about three or four hours. And, you know... At that point, I, I realized how fortunate I was to, to be in a program that does what The Last Mile is doing. I really didn't need any of that stuff. The parole agent was right. Um, and so the transition is, um, I don't know, it's just, it's amazing. It's, it's just, it feels great. Yes. I mean, there, there is a lot. You guys are really um, polite. Like, no one's asked me, you know, really hard questions like, why did you commit your crime? And why do, why do, you know, people ask these things, you know, why do prisoners deserve a second chance when there's people who have, who have um, you know, gone to school and done all of the right things in life and um, they can't get a job, right? There's people who have computer science degrees that are really struggling to find a place in the workplace and, um, and th those, those questions are, are tough questions. When you say things that people don't know about the prison system, the prison system is definitely not lockup, right? They go into the, those prisons and they find the worst situation and they put the worst situation on TV for people to see because they want, you know, if it, if it bleeds, it leads, is the old adage in journalism. Um, you know, they don't want to see... You know, people wouldn't watch TV if people saw a bunch of guys sitting there in a quiet room writing computer code. <laughs> it, it, you know, <laughs> but, the, you know, those type of things. Um, and the idea that everyone is just this hardened super criminal that wants to get out and do harm to, to society and their community, um, it's just not, it's not fact. And... And I'm not going to say that there's not those individuals because there definitely, definitely are those individuals that um, reside in the prison system and they need to be in the prison system. But there are a lot of people, most of the people in prison are in there because of lack of opportunity and making bad decisions based on their lack of opportunity. Yes. Um, I think... Neutrina could probably, I didn't get involved in that because I was one of the applicants. We receive about 100, uh, 150 to 200 applications for about 10 to 15 spots. And that's per facility. All right. Okay, yeah, sure. We could. Yeah, does anyone have uh, time for one more question? Okay. Did you end up serving your whole 14 years at so that's a very good question. So, the, first of all, the program is um, the, the way the program merged with the Department of Corrections is under uh, CT, what's called CTE, which is uh, career training, yeah, career technical education. And that requires that you have to be five years either to the board of prison terms or five years before you're going to go home. So in other words, if you, if you still have 20 years on your sentence, you can't get into the program. Um, and as far as my sentence, um, Bill Clinton signed into law this thing called the Truth in Sentencing Act. And it used to be that when you go into the prison system, you get half time. So um, if you're sentenced to 10 years, you do, if you're good, they use that as an incentive. You get half time, it's called good time work time credit. 
So you'll get a day for day. For every day you're in prison and you don't get into a fight and don't do anything terrible, they give you a day off your sentence. Um, because I was sentenced under the Truth and Sentencing Act, I had to do 85% of my time, which means you, you know I got 15% off. Um, I got all of that 15% off, but I had to do 12 years, four months on an almost 15-year sentence, which was a long time. One more comment before we close. Um, I know Ali mentioned TLM Works, which is our business, uh, which is our actual like for-profit website building. You can visit our website on tlmworks.org. You can check out our demos. We mentioned the Airbnb dashboard that we did. You can also see the different projects that our students have worked on. Our students are incredibly talented, incredibly driven, very motivated, and ready to build any website, apps, data visualizations that you might need. We also have designers on staff too. So let me know. I'm your girl. Give me a website. Thank you all. Thank you.